Hello, listeners. This is Rick Miller RD back again for another episode of the Miller Hour podcast. And oh my gosh, have I got a guest for you today? Uh, N- Dr. Nick Norwitz is someone I wanted to speak to for some time. And let me tell you a little bit about him before we get into chatting to him about the topic of today. So he's in the final throes of his dual doctorate. So that's PhD in MD. And he's a fellow YouTuber like myself and very much on a mission to make metabolic health mainstream. I first came across Nick when um, I saw some of his work on the lipid energy model and his expertise on all things to do with ketogenic diet diets and lean mass hyper responders, which we're going to get into in a moment's time. There'll be four links in the description down below to his channel so you can check out some of the amazing content that he puts out. And I really, really highly recommend that you check out his videos. They are very cool. And uh, yeah, let's talk to him right now. So, hey, Nick, how you doing, buddy? Great. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's pleasure's all mine, sir. The pleasure's all mine. So I gave a little snapshot there, obviously, of, of where you're at, Slither, but you've got a really interesting story about how you actually came into being interested in ketogenic diets and all things to do with high fats, low carb. Um, mm-hmm. Please, if you don't mind, embellish us. Yeah. So um, I grew up in a, a suburb of Boston to two... I'm actually two dual doctorate parents. Both my parents are MD PhDs. You have a very academic household. And I always wanted to be a physician scientist, what I always aspired to be. And I always consider myself pretty healthy, like a pretty healthy eater. I never struggled with weight. And I ate what I considered a balanced diet. Now, I was never somebody predisposed to struggle with obesity. So it was kind of like, you know, I'm going to eat my five a day. But, you know, if I'm going to have like a Cliff Bar, some Nutella. I was a runner. So like, you know, um, a teenage runner male athlete, you tend to eat a lot of junk and not really realize it. Anyway, I had a very conventional view of nutrition and the, you know, utmost respect, I still do to some extent for Western medicine. Um, But I ended up having some of my own health problems, probably like a lot of listeners and people in the space, um, really starting some in high school at the end of high school, but really in college. The thing that turned my life upside down was ulcerative colitis, which is an inflammatory bowel disease. So some people confuse IBS and IBD. To be clear, IBD is like I have ulcers opening in my colon. I'm, yeah, bloody diarrhea 20 times a day. It really turns your life upside down. Um, Not just the physical symptoms, but the anxiety and the psychological trauma that comes with that. It was at a point where I remember at the end of college, um, I was pretty academic um, and I was um really having a lot of stress around school but not because like everybody else was worried about going into a biochemistry exam and getting the right answers i was freaking out because i'm like am i gonna have like a bout of bloody diarrhea and have to run out of the exam um i remember one of the most stressful moments of my life was my graduation day where um i was actually um, I went to Dartmouth College and I was the valedictory speaker, which was kind of nice. I had the opportunity to speak in front of 11,000 people. Um, and nobody at this time really knew I was struggling with IBD. Um, like not to the extent, my parents definitely didn't even know the extent to which this was traumatizing me because it's embarrassing to talk about like bloody diarrhea. Um, and so I remember, you know, being in a situation where like, do, do I take this speaker spot which is like you know opportunity of a lifetime at least i felt like that at that age but then there's the possibility of going viral for having like a flare episode in front of eleven thousand people all my classmates all their parents i mean it's a high profile thing roger federer was like just gave the commencement address this year um actually i've had dual pictures of us like in the same position but nice i went up there and the the, the thing about that i mean you can go look up the lecture i mean the, the speech it wasn't very good but the the point that i'm trying to make is were you to watch that speech, you probably wouldn't pick up on any signs of anxiety. And the reason I want to highlight that is because there are a lot of people, um, like I was at this time, that are suffering silently, but suffering nonetheless. Um, and, you know, for me, my quality of life was nothing. And it got even worse when I went to Oxford. So I finished up at Dartmouth, went to Oxford to do my PhD. At that point in time, it If you, you know, knew of me or knew me, you're like, this kid has his life set on a silver platter. He has a MD spot and solidified at Harvard. He's doing a PhD at Oxford that's fully funded, like lucky him. 
But I was like in and out of the ICU. I felt awful. Yeah. I got to a position where, I mean, down to 100 pounds, like I'd lost 20% of my body weight in weeks because of a flare. And, you know, sitting in the hospital with bradycardia in the 20s, like life had really become not worth living. I, was in a, I wasn't suicidal, but I was in a place where it was like, my options are to die, which doesn't really sound nice. Again, I wasn't suicidal, but that was a feasible option. Linger in the state that I was, which was completely emaciated and cognitively not even really there, mm. or try random things, not random things, but try things out of desperation yeah. and hope something sticks. Now, to be clear at this time, I had no expectation that anything would work because it felt arrogant. Like I had the best ac access to healthcare in the world, Harvard and Oxford systems. Like if one of the world experts can't fix me, what am I like 21, 22 at the time? How could I possibly fix myself? But when you're desperate enough, you'll try anything. Of course. I tried a bunch of different things, different diets, the standard diets, you know, low FODMAP, specific carbohydrate, vegan, vegetarian, Mediterranean, whole 30, whatever. Eventually, skeptically, but I tried a ketogenic diet and like that, my life changed. Wow. My inflammatory markers dropped to basement. My brain just lit up. Mm -hmm. My, you know, mental health just lit up. I wasn't having bloody diarrhea all the time. Wow. And then years later, when I got my ex colonoscopy, I was in biopsy proven remission. And I've been in remission for five years without medications. That's incredible. So it was a big moment for me. And at the time that it happened, just to be clear, it wasn't like I completely, you know, you know, became a, a keto evangelist and went into the church of low carb. It was like, this is weird, yeah. but I guess I'm a medical zebra in lots of ways, um, which we won't get into in this podcast, but I'm like, all right, I, I'm an outlier in many ways. I had an outlier response. Cool. Whatever. I'm just happy I'm living. But it was a catalyst to get me interested in, let's call it the low carb community and the literature yes. around metabolic health. And long story short, now, uh, five years later, I have finished my PhD, I'm finishing up my MD. And my life passion and purpose is to make metabolic health mainstream. I'm still figuring out what that means. But in part, that means giving people the tools and confidence to take control of their own health, because I really do believe everybody has the capacity to have the sort of life transforming experience that I had. And, um, you know, I, I have a lot of respect still for the people in the current system. Yes. But our current medical system is dysfunctional for treating the chronic diseases that are ailing us. So we need to find another way, kind of a grassroots movement to empower people with knowledge and confidence. So I appreciate you having me on here to talk some science with you. Oh, wow. Um, well, like I said, the pleasure is, is totally on mine. And, you know, it just brings an absolute warmth to my heart when I hear stories like yours, Nick, you know, and obviously I've seen myself many, many, many individuals with autoimmune diseases like ulcerative colitis uh, over the years, Crohn's disease and, and such like, and it's, it's, sadly not not the mainstream advice to use something like a ketogenic diet or even really to look out with your uh, biologics or other types of um, corticosteroid medication really to be honest and it's 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 infuriating and but it does it does make me so happy to hear stories like yours where yeah. people have had success um so that's incredible so this obviously got you interested in yeah. wow this diet has changed my life literally in a in a matter of weeks months however long it took you to recover and then the rabbit hole got a little bit deeper so yeah tell us where, can, where can i add to... one thing though sorry to interrupt but i actually have one point that i really want to make which is you say it's infuriating that people aren't recommending say a ketogenic diet for ulcerative colitis hmm. the fact of the matter is we can't based on quote evidence-based medicine yes. and this is a yes. nuance i really want right. to get into because sure. let's do it you know like it's it's not you need a strong, you know, it's, it's a set of data for a clinician in the current system to, you know, recommend a treatment without, you know, being liable for negative outcomes. Yeah, and so if there aren't the, quote, rigorous RCTs to recommend, say, a ketogenic diet for ulcerative colitis, because those studies haven't been done, mm -hmm. then your physician can't, you know, you can't blame them for not recommending it. But that is a limitation of the available um, evidence base. So it 
And you hear this sometimes when people go to their doctor and their doctor, let's say the gastroenterologist says something to the effect of, you know, um, there isn't evidence that diet X can put your disease into remission. Yes. And that gets interpreted as, or it might have been stated as, diet X won't help your disease. But those are two very different things because right. absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Right. So it could very well be possible that like, you know, a clean ketogenic diet is the most potent intervention for ulcerative colitis. But if the data aren't there just because of the research infrastructure we have that is not devoted towards doing those studies, then they're not going to be recommended, yes. which is a huge problem. We can get into like issues of the research infrastructure, but yeah. I want to highlight that because you know, we pray at the altar of, quote, evidence-based medicine, but then we don't interrogate what that means and the yes. limitations of the research infrastructure we have. Agreed. Agreed. And I think, and I think it's this, um, it is this, this structure um, that we have facilitated ourselves with the best intention within healthcare, but ultimately it is, it is failing in, in many respects. Um, it is. So many, it is failing. And, and we have to, it, it supports the, uh, the pharmaceutical industry, I would say primarily, because obviously uh, the funding for new treatments are for various conditions across the world is mostly fu uh, funneled into pharmaceutical medications because you're going to get typically a quicker outcome, um, yeah. potentially. And, and obviously lifestyle interventions are like diet, right. et cetera, are much more long long term and so you you don't have the the pools of information which i think then brings me to my next point which is it's amazing for me and we hopefully we'll get onto this a little bit later when we talk about athletic performance later is people like uh, professor tim noakes and the noakes foundation working on the use of very low carbohydrate diets in um in 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 large-scale populations and seeing what what we can do and again most of that is, is completely self-funded so it's it's really really important um it is yeah. so um yeah no there's some really amazing groups and um, philanthropists like the bazookis i don't know if you know them mm -hmm. but like th the sad fact of the matter is there isn't the incentive structure to fund these sorts of trials because the uh, acute business model isn't clear I'm not making money from the pharmaceutical industry or Western medicine by not having ulcerative colitis. Mm -hmm. If I were on a biologic, I, I would be to some extent. Exactly. So it's, it's not that like, you know, people are bought off, doctors are bought off by pharma. It's just the incentive structure is manipulated. Okay. And so unfortunately, we have this system, and this is really sad, but where a lot of the research is coming out of or is a function of people suffered. And those people just happen to have resources that they can direct. So in the case of the bazookis, um, their billionaires and their son, Matt Bazuki suffered with crippling bipolar disorder mm -hmm. that eventually got better on a ketogenic diet. He was under the treatment of uh, Dr. Chris Palmer at Harvard. And then because they're billionaires are like, this is so important. We need to fund this. But that was a function of Matt suffering for years. And so, I mean, that's just the, we need to have a better system, but unfortunately that's where we are. I can get over on a whole other like diatribe about did you hear about, this is a tangent, but uh, the Maryland Secretary of Health um, decision about like closing that trial in Maryland? Oh, I didn't. No, please. So, all right, this is, my, this is a little tangent, but a call to action. So last week, big news was that um, there was a, a, an inpatient trial going on in Maryland, a ketogenic diet for schizophrenia. Mm. It was on, like, ongoing. It was completely safe, completely ethical, went through all reviews, it was being run by a PI with like 25 had 25 NIH trials behind her, you know, all the I's were dotted, T's were crossed. And the Maryland Secretary of Health, just for a quote, procedural decision, which I don't even know what that means, decided to terminate the study. What? And there was an outcry yeah. on social media. The, uh, a petition was put out by um, Dr. Chris Palmer saying, we need to overturn this decision. In like two days, it got like 20,000 signatures. Yeah. Andrew Huberman was tweeting about it. Like it was really a big outcry because like we talked about the dysfunctional incentive structure. So like after going through the hurdles of getting funding, mm -hmm. getting ethical approval, getting recruits, getting like everything set up and the study's rolling, then somebody can just arbitrarily come in and be like, yeah, we don't want this for whatever quote procedural reason. It's ridiculous. Like so the number of hurdles one has to jump over. So I actually plug that just because if this podcast comes out and it's still ongoing, hopefully you can drop a link to the petition below. Sure. So people can just contribute their name. It takes 20 seconds. Yeah. 
and like this kind of stuff is completely inappropriate. I just people are suffering. We need these metabolic health studies. I don't think like you know bureaucrats should get in the way. Absolutely, and and it just completely uh, obliterates people's faith in in the healthcare system when stuff like that happens because people yeah. are looking for you know rigorous science around all these sorts of interventions which have maybe have given them you know complete relief, but then somebody comes along and just just you know just pulls the rug from underneath it all, and that's uh, that's the end of that. Yeah, it just doesn't help, does it? Gosh, yeah. But moving 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 beyond. Uh, you know the uh, the issues associated with even getting research in ketogenic diets done. Yeah. At all. Let's talk about you know what you and and Dave Feldman and and colleagues have have worked together on to to understand, which is this phenomena known as the lean mass hyper responder. And obviously, there are lots of major benefits to ketogenic diets but one of the major things that, that i think a lot of people get very concerned about and certainly physicians get concerned about is changes in um by uh, blood lipid panels so mm -hmm. and what i would love if you wouldn't mind just explaining what that can can ultimately look like in certain individuals as we see yeah. from this lean mass hyper responder group right so I think it's not surprised, probably isn't surprised to a lot of people listening that LDL cholesterol, the quote bad cholesterol, mm. I think that's a term that's going out of style for yeah, a lot of reasons, yeah. but is idea. the boogeyman of low carb diets. Yeah. It's like, oh, you go low carb, your cholesterol is going to go through the roof and it's going to like destroy your heart. Yeah. There's a lot of literature bias. We can dig into how ridiculous some of it is. But that aside, it is true that some people, a minority, I might add, see increases in cholesterol. The majority see no major change or even decreases. And so a question arises, what's special about the people who have increases in cholesterol? And if you're thinking superficially, you're just going to be like, yeah, they're guzzling butter. They're eating more saturated fat. Or you wave your hands. It's like, ah, it's some genetic thing, right? You could say that. I consider that kind of superficial thinking. So rewinding the clock a little bit, back in 2017, my friend Dave Feldman, made an observation that was kind of weird, which was like, he went low carb and um, his cholesterol went through the roof and he got kind of freaked out like anybody would. And, um, and then he noticed something, which was not only did his LDL cholesterol go up, but his HDL cholesterol went up a lot too and his triglycerides went down. So the one observation was, oh, it's not one marker, it's a triad, high LDL, high HDL, low triglycerides that ended up becoming the lean mass hyperresponder triad. The lean mass component comes from the fact not that you need to be lean technically to fit the criteria for lean mass hyperresponders, but that this triad, the high LDL, the high HDL, the low triglycerides in people who go low carb tend to occur. Now, this is just Dave making an empiric observation in the world around him in the lean athletic people. And the leaner people tended to be, and the more active they were, the higher their LDL went up. And now that's kind of paradoxical when you think about it, right? Because if we think, oh, quote, LDL is bad, then why would the healthy people, the lean, metabolically healthy people, be having a, quote, bad response? So that was in 2017. There was some outside-the-box thinking from a software engineer who didn't have formal, you know, medical training. But anybody can make an amazing observation. So that's where things started. And I'm, I'm patting myself on the back right now because I never give enough credit to Dave. This really did start with Dave. And his um, innovative was like, you know, it was a great observation. Now, fast forward a little bit. We've now published over 10 papers on this topic, the lean mass hyperresponders. And what we found in multiple studies is one, this is a genuine phenotype, the high LDL, high HDL, low triglyceride. And when I say high, I mean, in some people so high that most doctors have never seen levels this high. Yeah. So high that if even I, who I'm about to finish my second doctorate at Harvard, tell an attending what these levels are, they think I'm mistaken. They're like, he must have like misread the panel or something. Like, this isn't possible. Uh, or if they see the numbers, they're like, wow, this patient either needs to go on pharmacotherapy right now, or they should go shopping for a headstone because they're going to die. Like freakishly high levels. Um, so just to give you a number, if you actually know the numbers, I've, I've seen LDL levels like six, 700. Um, although the criteria are, I should have said them, is LDL above 200, HDL above 80, triglycerides below 70. Um, and that's the lean mass hyperresponder triad. So this is a real phenomenon. And indeed, 
one of the driving factors for high LDL on a ketogenic diet appears to be lower BMI, much more so than saturated fat. So we did a meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials. People talk about the gold standard being RCTs. We did a meta-analysis of 41 RCTs published in the top um, nutrition journal in the country. The first author was Adrian Soto Mota, who um, is a friend of mine from Oxford and does a lot of research with us on lean mass hyperresponders. He did a, you know, a brilliant set of analyses. And what we showed was that if you look at all the trials with low-carb diets, less than 130 grams of carbs, if you cluster them based on BMI categories, only those in the lean normal BMI, less than 25 kilograms per meter squared category, have increases in LDL. Overweight, class 1 obesity, no increases. Class 2 obesity, you actually see a decrease. And there's an inverse association between BMI and LDL change. All that just means the leaner you are, the higher your LDL tends to go up, all else being equal when you're low carb. And it's a much more powerful effect than saturated fat intake. So these are some interesting observations. So we now have a lean mass hyperresponder phenotype. And, you know, some questions arise. One, what is the mechanism? We can talk about that. And two, and I want to highlight, this is an open question. What is the risk? Yes. Because that is a legitimate question. And the answer is unknown. Absolutely. And um, just, to, just to support what Nick is saying. So, so last year, um, I actually went on a ketogenic diet just out of interest, just because it's something I've never actually tried. And actually, my bloods in April of 2023, which I'll share on a separate YouTube video going through some of those uh, panels so that people can see what it looked like, my own uh, total cholesterol went up to nearly 10 millimoles per litre, which is something like over 300, I think, in terms of milligrams per deciliter. And my uh, LDL cholesterol went up to nearly 7 millimoles per litre. Um, and but my triglycerides were 0.6 millimoles per liter. So mm. again, we've got this sort of triad going on here um, of very high total cholesterol, high LDL, um, and low yeah. triglyceride. And also, yeah. the HDL was above above two as well. Yeah, yeah. No, that's quite high um, for convert. I mean, to convert um, HDL and, and LDL from millimoles per liter squared to milligrams per deciliter, I think you multiply by 38.67. So for people either side of the pond, I think your LDL was like 270, which is astronomically high. That said, just even looking at you, even looking at your face on this Zoom call, I could have called that would have didn't happen to you because you're yes. a very lean person. That's correct. Um, my, my, just, my, my weight yeah. had probably had dropped down to one of the leanest I had been for a while in terms of my athletic career, which is as a yeah. martial artist and yeah. I wasn't a shredded body fat on me. No. Um, and, you know, I was doing fine. Now, the thing is, just to, just to caveat this and what, what Nick was saying about what does that mean, I saw this panel and thought, right, I should go and get it checked out by a cardiologist. They obviously panic stations. And they said, let's go and do a full battery of tests. Let's do a CT angiogram, make sure everything's okay. Um, now, uh, when I actually had that done, everything was completely clear. There was no evidence of any soft plaque or hard plaque. Mm -hmm. So this was a very interesting phenomenon. And it did surprise my cardiologist because she said, I've never seen levels so high yeah. at all. And yet, right. this, is, this is an abnormal CT right. angiogram result. So that was quite interesting. And abnormal as in it was normal and you would have expected it to have plaque. Bingo. Do you have, so I want to caveat that. There's a couple points I want to make. Um, do you had a, did you have a baseline cholesterol from before keto? Yes. And it was, and it was normal. And it was normal. So what, um, one of my mentors, William Cromwell would say is an important question to ask is how high, how long, right? Cause exactly. even going with the conventional wisdom, you need to have levels elevated for a while for plaque to arise, but. Here's the thing that your cardiologist was probably missing was that these levels are just assumed to be genetic mm -hmm. because this isn't a phenomenon people are observing. So when he saw that, I don't know if he knew your prior panels, but he probably just assumed you must have a genetic dysfunction, which means you must have had this your whole life. Yeah. So then he assumed you had lifelong exposure and then was surprised yeah. at the, quote, abnormal normal result. And so I really want to emphasize that because for a couple of reasons. One, just because your panel was clear after a short period of time with LDL doesn't mean it will be in 10 years, which is important. But two, 
that people aren't aware of this phenomenon. And you see this in, in clinical guidance where it's like, you know, if you have an LDL above 190, you're supposed to go on pharmacotherapy. End of story. Because it's assumed then you have familial hypercholesterolemia. And the funny thing about FH, familial hypercholesterolemia, which is a genetic disease, like, you know, it, it's, it's congenital, it's now defined by the phenotype. And what I mean by that is if you have an LDL that's high enough, they're like, you must have genetic dysfunction. That's basically how it's coded in to the diagnostic criteria. Yeah. Because people aren't aware of the lean mass hyperresponder phenotype. And yet there's no clear signs of, you know, we haven't found any genes associated with lean mass hyperresponders. And the physiology is different. So treatment options can be different. So mm. kind of, you know, alluding to some goofy things I've done, or not goofy, but like, I mean, quite serious, like in, in a pretty rigorous manner, I've put high intensity statin therapy, Crestor, the kind of, I think uh, Dr. Thomas Dayspring, who was very pro apoB lowering, if people know him, Elio, he, I think he calls Crestor like a gorilla statin. So I took high dose gorilla statin and then compared it to Oreo cookies. People might know about this experiment. The Oreo cookies were twice as potent as the statin. Why? Because I understand the physiology behind lean mass hyperresponders that we think is going on. And so if I address the root cause physiology by adding back carbs, I can reverse the phenotype. And so you end up with these bizarre phenomena where I predict, you know what? I can lower my cholesterol more by adding a sleeve of Oreo cookies to my diet than you know, one of the most profitable drugs in history. Quite. And I, I, I get why that's provocative. It was intended to be provocative. But despite the fact that it is provocative or, you know, in parallel with that, it works and it's freaky and it's based on an understanding of new physiology that we need to talk about. And that is shocking and remarkable and freaking cool, aside from the fact that it's also scary. Yeah. So we can parse these things. We can say, this is new science that is fascinating. We should talk about it and get excited about it scientifically. And at the same time, admit what we don't know and say, look, we need to study this. We need to make it a research priority. But in the absence of knowledge, we should also treat each patient on a one-by-one -one basis, basis with as appropriate like clinical conservatism as we can. Okay. So at no point here are me and any of my colleagues claiming yeah. this is a safe phenotype. We're just saying this is the frontier of science. We want to admit this is the frontier of science. And we have some legitimate questions that we want answers to. Absolutely. And it surprised me, actually, even just seeing that that data in myself, you know, having done yeah. cholesterol tests done over the over the, the years and it all being very normal, um, obviously having carbohydrates in my diet all the time. And since that experiment, I have put carbohydrates back into my diet again in small amounts. So I'm yeah. going to repeat this this test and see what what those values are, which I'll I'll share. But I think I think it would be good if you don't mind, Nick, to maybe for those you've never come across this phenomena to explain why is it that this appears to occur or what's the what's the proposed yeah. physiology that's behind the lean mass hyperresponder phenotype right so the mechanism we have in mind again credit to dave feldman for um birthing this brain baby um which i think i've helped to rear but uh, he gestated it um the lipid energy model in a nutshell, what it's saying is if you're lean and insulin sensitive, you're able to shift towards fat burning a lot more than someone with obesity. And you liberate free fatty acids from your fat tissue. Some of it is burned locally by muscle. So if you have some fat on your arm and it releases some free fatty acids, some of the bicep might burn it. But then a lot of it gets trafficked around the body and ends up being taken up by the liver. And those individual free fatty acids get repackaged onto the storage form of fat triglycerides. And because fat and um, you know, aqueous solutions, watery solutions don't like to mix. You need a carrier particle to carry the fat back around the body for systemic fuel trafficking. So the triglycerides get packaged onto these very low density lipoproteins, these big spheres, very low density lipoprotein VLDL. They get shipped out from the liver and then they circulate around your body to bring fat back to the fat tissue and also bring it to muscle. So what happens at fat and muscle, we call them peripheral tissues, peripheral to the liver, is that the VLDL gets turned over. So the, uh, an, an enzyme called lipoprotein lipase sucks the triglycerides out of the core of the VLDL to replenish the fat tissue and uh, feed the muscle tissue. And as you suck out the core of this VLDL, it shrinks. 
and the VLDL becomes an LDL. The LDL has longer residence time, so you end up with LDL particles containing LDL cholesterol. The cholesterol fraction in the LDL is the LDL cholesterol. So you have this LDL cholesterol now. Your triglycerides are low because the triglycerides are getting sucked out really quickly from the VLDL, and they're transforming into these LDLs, which are sticking around longer than the VLDLs. And that's two parts of the triad, right? The low triglycerides, the high LDL. The last part is the HDL. Where does that come from? Well, as you shrink this VLDL sphere into an LDL, when you shrink a sphere, the surface area must decrease. So components of the surface get shed off and taken up by acceptor particles that are HDL. So you're transferring cholesterol to the HDL acceptor particles as well. So you end up with this lean mass hyperspondent triad with high LDL, high HDL, low triglycerides. Now, you can think of that system kind of like as a flywheel, right? The fatty acids are getting released, going to the liver, getting exported on VLDL, things are getting turned over, and flywheel spins. Understanding that physiology allows you to, you know, make predictions about what would happen if you do certain interventions. So, for example, if I add back carbs and I remove the driving force for this to be occurring, then the flywheel should slow down and my LDL should drop. Does that work? Well, yeah. That's why adding freaking Oreo cookies to my diet as a pure addition will lower my LDL. But there are other predictions that one can make too. So if you hold things the same and increase exercise, exercise is good for you, right? But what will happen to your cholesterol if you're a lean mass hyperspawner? It'll go up because the flywheel will need to spin faster to supply fuel. So you know, to actually rigorously test this model, there are certain things we need to do that we don't have the resources for at this point in time, like, you know, do radio tracer studies. I got a quote for one of these studies for 30 people would be about $2 million. I don't have $2 million. If you're a billionaire listening and want to give me $2 million, feel free. But where we're stuck with now, or where we're at right now is, honestly, we have a ragtag bunch of, we have a software engineer a med student and uh, MD, PhD, Adrian Sotomota down in uh, Mexico is a practicing clinician, kind of trying to lead this. We don't have a lot of resources, so we're trying to do innovative things to demonstrate elements of this model, hence Oreo versus statin. If I had millions of dollars to do studies, I wouldn't be doing Oreo versus statin. But the point is, where we are in this research is we have a model, we have a hypothesis and we're willing to go out there and make bold predictions with respect to our model and see where the data fall. So we're at you know an early stage in developing this literature. Um, and the nice thing about 2024 is like there's this, there's this incursion of academia and social media in the public. So you get to be with us on this journey. Exactly. I'm not saying we have 20 years I was eight years old 20 years ago. I'm not saying we have 20 years of data on this topic. I'm saying this is the frontier. Isn't this cool? What questions do you have? Because you can add them to my bank of questions and we can explore this together. Interesting. It's, it's, it is a really amazing time to, to be in this field. And also, I think it's, it's amazing that we can get this information out through social media, through YouTube. Yeah. And people can hear about it and then they can support and contribute that wasn't available you know i know it's amazing uh, it's just it's just amazing um so you've explained which is amazing you've explained how the the lipid energy model helps to explain the lean mass hyperresponder phenotype what i wanted to talk about a little bit though is this this aspect of um of bmi which you mentioned a little bit earlier and i guess how that how that fits into maybe the let's talk about the obesity epidemic because the, 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 the situation you've got here is that if you, presumably, if you increased calories further, what you would get from probably the, the conventional paradigm is that you, well, you'll just gain weight. You'll just gain weight thereafter because there's a certain amount of calories that everybody must be burning per day in order to maintain weight. But I know from your, some of your videos that you put out that actually when you are on a ketogenic diet, in some situations that doesn't always seem to happen and perhaps the lipid energy model can give us some information as to why that's the case well um why if you eat more calories you don't tend to gain as much weight Any reason. so what i would say is um i'm not going to use the lipid energy model to explain that but i think you can put it under the larger umbrella of fuel partitioning and what i mean by that is 
we, we like to simplify things and we like to think, oh, calories in, calories out. And you can just shove calories down somebody's throat and they'll gain weight because they get shoved into fat tissues. Newsflash, biology is more complicated than that. Um, and really everything in your body, lipid energy model talks about fat trafficking, but it's all about how are your body's hormones, you know, directing where the fuel goes and what are the consequences of that? So, you know, with respect to the en lipid energy model, the fact that it occur, you know, it tends to occur in this phenotype, lean mass hyperresponder phenotype in leaner people has probably to do with lower levels of hormones like leptin and insulin, but a lot of other adipokines, myokines, hepatokines, that's basically fancy terms for hormones coming from different organs, adipo, fat, myo, muscle, hepato, liver, and it's a whole orchestra. But um, kind of now shifting gears, talk about like obesity, again, larger umbrella of fuel partitioning, it's the same with obesity, that it's really about how your body's hormonal system and your metabolism is, is directing energy trafficking. And then the downstream results are things like obesity. So it, it, it flips the paradigm. And I think it's just because we have so internalized the idea that calories are the problem. And the fact of the matter is that's not necessarily the case. And people, I think, have trouble getting over this mental hurdle of, oh, but then you're saying calories don't matter. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying when you take this equation, this energy equation, energy in minus energy out equals, equals mm. energy stored, the equals does not imply causation. Mm. So it's very possible that the energy dealt, like basically you're storing fat or you're storing energy somewhere. And downstream of that, you're having compensatory responses whereby you're decreasing um, energy output and you're increasing energy intake. So it's a way of thinking, think about it like this. Um, you're, the calories are not driving the car of obesity. They're just the tires and they're being directed by the driver, which is something else. And that is fuel partitioning. And that's completely consistent with thermodynamics. And honestly, I think it better represents the data because you can break the conventional idea that it's all just about calories. You can do these studies, like you take animals and you pair feed them. So you feed them the same number of calories, but you manipulate one condition whereby even given the same number of calories or fewer calories, those animals can gain more fat, right? And you can do things whereby fat gain is, um, comes before um like overeating which comes downstream so so you're suggesting that the that the uh uh as you said quite eloquently that the uh, the calorie intake is very much coming along for the ride but actually the driver of this process is something a combination of different hormonal factors or and or other factors going on in centrally, exactly centrally so exactly and and it's 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 difficult for the average person to it, it, well, it's difficult to internalize. I wouldn't. I don't want to like be patronized and say the average person, just because uh, the research and the complexities of it, the practicalities, are such that you can lead. You can get very misleading results. So, as an example, um, it's also true that if you just shove calories down someone's throat, they will gain weight in short-term feeding trials, and people tend to think, oh. Human studies are always better than animal studies. We have these heuristics, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you can do a study where you control human behavior and intake, then that's going to be the gold standard. So you can take people, you lock them in a metabolic ward, and if you try to make them eat more calories or manipulate the scenario so they eat more calories, then they might gain weight. But that actually doesn't really give you much information about what drives the actual obesity epidemic and obesity in real-world contexts yeah. because it doesn't allow time for metabolic adaptations to occur and behavioral adaptations that can cause the pendulum to swing backward. Bingo. So the acute you know, phenomenon doesn't necessarily translate to the chronic because you can have metabolic adaptations. In fact, you do have metabolic adaptations. Um, and so you can end up getting misleading results. We actually had a study on this earlier this year where we reanalyzed a very popular um, uh, nature medicine paper and found that there was a fundamental flaw where they didn't account for this metabolic adaptation. And basically the results were inverted from what was probably going on in reality physiologically. You can, 
you can provide the link to that paper and a video I did on it. But um, I mean, to be clear, for those maybe following this area, this isn't me like trying to be a again, I think I've used this term before because it gets bandied about, like low-carb evangelist or low-carb zealot. This is something that I think is, among those who are a little bit less dogmatic, kind of generally accepted. I had an interview with the people who know the name Walter Willett. He's one of the most, if not the most, cited researchers in nutrition in the world. And he's very pro-plant-based, but I went to his house, had a conversation. As this study is a case in point, he literally said, wow, the results are worse than useless. They're misleading. Those are his words. And, and, and we have a whole, you know, mountain of literature, the literature that is directing guidelines and directing common knowledge that is taught in medical schools. And I can tell you that for a fact mm. that is misleading people to understand obesity as a calorie problem when it's not a calorie problem. Mm. Um, calories are present. And that's the whole thing. It's, it's hard to explain because calories are present. And it was actually, there was a beautiful paper in obesity by Mark Friedman et al. And one of the points they made is, you know, okay, you can do this thing where you pair feed animals, right? So that you control their calories. You can even feed one group less and they'll still gain more fat depending on the scenario. But it's also true that if you take that group and you either restrict their calories or give them unlimited access to calories, they'll be able to manifest an obesity phenotype more if they have unlimited access to calories, like our food environment. So it doesn't mean calories don't matter, but the calories aren't the problem. And when I say problem, I mean the etiology, the match that's starting the fire. They can be wood piled on, an ongoing fire, but yes. they're not the match. And so we want to identify what is the cause, what is the match? And that is fuel partitioning, not calories. And people like... That's a hard conversation to have because people yeah. just don't want to even go there. I actually kind of poked the issue with a Joe, like a Joe Rogan clip on Instagram recently. I, was, I texted my friend. There was this Joe Rogan clip where he says, in six seconds, calories aren't the problem, brother. It's sugar and bullshit. And I'm like sitting with this quote. I'm like, man, do I put this on Instagram? Because you can see it. You just know. I'm going to take six seconds of Joe Rogan, screen cut it with bacon frying in a pan, and I'm going to get, you know, 300,000 views easy. And coupled with that, I can put like, you know, um, like a, you know, a 200 word caption explaining the things I'm sharing on this podcast. Yeah. Should I do that? I ended up doing it. It did get over 300,000 views, like easy, because you know it will. But you look at the responses and everybody's like, you idiot. Like, it's all about calories. Like, look at these controlled trials. And I'm like, but you... You haven't thought about it deeply enough. When he's saying calories aren't the problem now, he wouldn't necessarily explain it the same way as me, but I'm saying calories aren't the match starting the fire. I'm not saying calories don't matter, no. but I'm saying we need to think a level deeper about the etiology because the fact of the matter is we've been stuck in a calorie mindset for a while and that is not fixing the problem. And honestly, it's not that scientific. No, and um, I think even from my own observation of this, I mean, I used to work primarily in obesity management when I first qualified as a dietitian. And I mean, you can imagine the hundreds of thousands of people that I saw, you know, 10 minutes here going through every day. And individuals would quite rigorously follow the amount of calories sometimes that they were following for, for, for years. You know, they'd go into Weight, weight Watchers and all these different slimming groups, and they would be rigorously counting calories. And, and you would be amazed well, maybe not be, but like, but maybe some listeners would be, be amazed at the, the divergence sometimes in the results that you would expect based on what Nick's actually saying through this equation. So yeah. you, you, you would see people eating what would seemingly be on paper, you know, very, very few calories and getting very, very little in terms of weight loss. And then you would see others barely trying and they're doing absolutely brilliantly. And the, the, the common objection or the scorner in the audience would be saying, oh, well, they're still lying to you, aren't they? They're just, they're just not trying, but they're lying. But I, I, I used to home visit lots of these patients. And I used to inspect, inspect their fridges and see what they were doing. Yeah. Yes, they could have hidden everything before I came in or whatever. But to be honest, lots of them lived in very small homes and you'd have seen it coming out of the cupboards or whatever. And I would say a lot of them were really, really trying and, and actually doing the formula of, of calories in versus calories out. My personal feeling on this is exactly what Nick's saying, is that there are external factors which are not accounted for within these RCT trials. For instance, um, 
the environment that one lives in, how much we know that, for instance, individuals who get more more sunlight, um, we know that there are specific genes that are activated on the skin, like uh, pro-opioid mel melanocortin, which may affect things like appetite regulation. Um, we know that individuals who, um, again, have a better a better kind of activity level throughout the day, you know, maybe they have more outside routine, they, they tend to be slimmer overall. Why? Because this may be affecting some of these other internal milieu structures, maybe it's affecting the microbiome in some way by being in contact with the earth. We don't know, but none of these RCTs account for these factors at all. And I think this is the problem, is that um, we're all getting hung up on the calories, but actually maybe we should be thinking a bit broader in terms of our, yeah. our, our audience. Well, you at least can't account for them in free living humans over a long period of time. Absolutely. Um, which is where, you know, animal models is coming to the picture. And yes, it's like the physiology differs in animals. But what we're really demonstrating is a principle that you can uncouple calories from fat gain. And yes, that, you know, if, if, if the whole thing is you can't break physics, well, we're not breaking physics. We're demonstrating the principle that, you know, physics and physiology are two different things. And they can be consistent, but they're, you know, they're distinct. So if, if a mouse can, quote, break thermodynamics, then so can a human. Um, and so, yeah, I think different, you know, we have to interpret that mechanistic literature with a grain of salt, but it's nevertheless useful. It's, a, it's funny. It's a very common comment, but just because I like to um, chase the basic science like nature and cell metabolism, where I'll do a paper and they're like, this is rubbish it's in a mouse i'm like yeah but like we're studying leptin in a, the brain like to do this in humans you'd need to genetically modify them then chop the heads off at the end of the study like are you in a volunteer for that yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> like so there's different types of literature which have their functions they just need to be interpreted with caution but again circling back to the big point i think this is all about shifting mindset and thinking about fuel partitioning is the problem which has really functional consequences, like actionable consequences for those listening. I don't know if you're someone who's kind of stuck in a calories mindset, but thinking about this from a fuel partitioning and chronic perspective, it's like, this is a marathon, not a sprint. Think about making food choices that will favorably affect fuel partitioning. If you're someone that might be insulin resistant, that's eating lower carb, lower glycemic load foods, that can be things like avocados, macadamia nuts, fatty fish, fatty meat, whole eggs, full fat dairy that are targeting fuel partitioning, not necessarily what's going to affect the scale tomorrow morning, you know? And um, that's probably why we find consumption of these foods doesn't tend to associate with obesity. That's why even eating avocados tends to not associate with obesity when calorie focused models tend to say, oh, well, they're fatty, and then that's going to be a problem. Actually, I don't know. Have you been following the whole satiety per calorie thing? Uh, yes. My goodness. Yeah, they, uh, the, I'll have a video separately on this. It's been a kind of thorn in my side. There's um, some, um, let's just say, not scientifically rigorous individuals that are focusing on, you know, they, well, let's put it this way. They it's an interesting case study. This is how I'm going to pitch it. So if this comes out before I release the video, then people can see it coming. Um, as uh, something that is like pretty, you know, non, is diatribe agnostic. It sounds pretty reasonable. And it's a brilliant case study in marketing over science. But basically what they say is if you focus on foods that keep you full for the amount of calories they provide, you're going to lose weight and that's going to be better. And that sounds really good on the yeah, surface, right? It sounds so reasonable, but there's a few problems with it. One, it still puts calories in the denominator, so it's really calorie centric. But two, it's an interesting abstract concept. I'm okay with it as a heuristic, but if you're going to generate, say, a scoring system to score foods in this way, well, what is the literature you're basing it on? And again, it's all these problematic, misleading studies. And so what you end up with is a scoring system that can't be relied upon because garbage in, garbage out. You're putting garbage data into it without a system. Mm -hmm. And you end up with output that is always going to be garbage. I bring this up because I was just thinking there was some post recently about uh, high satiety per calorie ice cream. It was ranking Halo Top ice cream better than avocados. And I'm like, but well, because Halo Top ice cream has more protein than avocados, do you really think? And the claim was 
what is the best ice cream for metabolic health? And it was saying Halo Top and like Arctic peanut butter chocolate ice cream scores of 52 and 53 were better than like avocados and olives, which are like high salt and hedonic and like fatty. I'm like, it's just the, the weird claims people make that are, and the reason this relates to this conversation of fuel purchasing are an extrapolation of the mindset we're stuck in about calories being the problem. Yes. When calories are not the problem, they're not the ideology. And it's something There's something like, downstream. Yeah, it's something that I covered with uh, Professor Ben Bigman when he came on the podcast a few episodes ago. And having studied this area for what decades now, I think he's been at least twenty years into into the work of sort of looking at insulin and, and the obesity mm. model. His 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 quote really is that hunger will always win, and I under so I understand where this kind of paradigm comes from. You know, we're chasing down hunger. But the way that we're attacking the problem, I think, as you say, is through satiety-based mechanisms of you know, trying to trying to increase fiber content or just unnaturally increase the protein content of a food which is not satiating anyway, like ice cream. And yeah. I don't, the, the human body, as we've we've said a few times in this lovely little little chat, is 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 far is far more complex than this. You can't out trick, I think, the human body by 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 artificially adding protein and a bit of fiber to an ice cream. I don't think that that's enough. I think you have to change the, the physiological conditions as that. it were that it's actually placed in. And so one of those obviously is Professor Bickman suggests and to the extent where we're talking about is by getting insulin levels down first by reducing yeah. carbohydrate consumption, that alone starts to flip this switch and help with people managing their, their appetite and satiety, even if they're eating these kind of quote unquote high fat foods, high calorie foods, which people, you know, in the conventional literature would be saying, oh, people tend to overeat on high fat foods. Well, yeah. no, not necessarily. Yeah, you're, I, I, I want to try out a concept. This is based on a video I just recorded the raw footage for this morning. So people can check out the video in its final form. Hopefully it'll be good. But I was covering this, this new obesity paper on fuel partitioning. And I wanted to wrap it into this concept. The way I opened the video is saying, um, the midnight cake phenomenon, you know, that feeling where you're like, I really shouldn't, I really shouldn't, but then you do where you're fighting with yourself about, you know, what, you know, it's a smart choice, but then what you end up is like, you know, this urge to engage in a behavior. Mm -hmm. And the point I make following that is we have this hope, you know, you, you imagine yourself opening the fridge at midnight, there's the cake, the chocolate cake, it's sitting there and you want it. And then you give in. And you believe next time, oh, but I just need to have a stronger will and I'll overcome that behavior. And there's hope for me, you know, shifting. And that is the problem. And the thing is, that's predicated on the idea that you're, you're fighting your, you know, human will and the behavior. And that's the problem when what well, you're actually fighting, the real urge is coming from something that you can't control, which is, let's say, the hungry fat cell. Your fat cell doesn't have a brain. So if your fuel partitioning is screwed up, such that you're packing away more fat in those fat cells, the hunger, you standing there needing that cake is downstream of something that is, well, it's not out of your, it's out of your willpower. It's downstream of a dysfunction in fuel partitioning. So to Ben Bickman's point, hunger always wins, but hunger is downstream of the dysfunctional fuel partitioning. So what you need to do is figure out how do we construct a metabolic milieu so that you don't even end up with that scenario in the first place, because you're not fighting your willpower. You're not fighting that moment of behavior. Mm -hmm. What you need to do, the battle you need to fight is upstream of that at your fat cell. Absolutely. Absolutely. I want to come back a little bit, if that's okay, back to the, yeah. uh, the live protein chat, because we've, we've, we've talked about uh, obesity mm -hmm. and, and energy partitioning, and um, I'd love to return to live proteins if that's okay. So Absolutely. Where, where do you, so, what what do you think is the, the key takeaway for uh, individuals who maybe are on a keto diet at the moment and maybe they're they're concerned about mm -hmm. LDL? Um, maybe they, they they've even heard the terms APOB as we talked about at the beginning. Yeah. You know, what's the what's the context here and what what should they be thinking about? Right. Just to hit the term APOB quickly. Um, ApoB is um, a lipoprotein um, on the particles, like LDL particles. So LDL is part of a class of ApoB-containing lipoproteins. 
And and basically, you can think about it as like ApoB is a better, better marker for what is presumed to matter than the LDL cholesterol fraction. And they can kind of uncouple. But um, often I get the questions like, oh, well, LDL is high, but what is the ApoB? If you're a lean mass hyperresponder and your LDL is through the roof, your ApoB is high. There's no way it's not. There might be a difference in like the LDL to ApoB ratio, but it's still very, very high. So, um, you know, if you want to get an ApoB, I, I do think it's a better marker. But for the purposes of our conversation, you can kind of use these markers interchangeably. The first thing I'd say is if you're thinking about starting a ketogenic diet, and you have obesity, you are very unlikely to see a large increase in LDL that persists. There might be a blip as you transition, but it's not going to be an LDL of, you know, yours is 7 millimoles or 270 milligrams per deciliter, or mine's been as high as 545 milligrams per deciliter, like absurdly high. That's very, very, very unlikely to happen. You can monitor for it, but I think it's very unlikely to happen. If you're a lean person, it's probably likely to happen. Um, there are ways you can reduce this possibility. Um, while fiber and um, unsaturated fats aren't as strong levers as net carbohydrates, all things being equal, if you tried to generate a ketogenic diet that was very high fiber, especially soluble fiber, and um, low in saturated fats, it would have some impact, although you might still manifest. Like I've seen people on zero cholesterol, low saturated fat, vegan keto diets, if they're lean enough, their LDL will jump. Um, so it could still happen, at which point I think it's up to the individual to consider how is this in intervention valuable to me and is it worth, as in your case, just adding back some carbs? Do you need to be in ketosis? If you don't therapeutically, then have a sweet potato. You can still have like a relatively low-carb diet. You can do intermittent fasting cycles and attenuate your LDL levels. Yes. Um, that's an option. If you need a ketogenic diet therapeutically, there are pharmacological options, which are options. I'm not here to tell you they are or they aren't. That's a conversation for you to have with your doctor and for you to consider the pros and cons of them. Don't okay. get you know, your, your medical advice off of social media. Yeah. Um, but now from a scientific point of view, you know, I, I get back to we're asking legitimate questions. I don't know what the risk profile is associated with high LDL. People talk about the, quote, preponderance of evidence. If you go to your cardiologist and you say, oh, well, lean mass hyperresponders, yada, yada, yada. This is just, there are like certain like jargons and lingo that people like to, in academia, lean towards. One is the preponderance of evidence, which is kind of saying we have this whole huge body of literature from decades of work that suggests X, Y, and Z. Yes. But here's the rub. The preponderance of evidence is handicapped by the populations from which that evidence was drawn. Yeah. So if we have a unique novel phenotype from which that is unique from all the like populations from which this quote preponderance of evidence was drawn, then what is the relevance of that preponderance of evidence? I'm not saying it has no relevance. I'm saying it's handicapped evidence yeah. and that we don't know what the answer is with respect to absolute risk. Hmm. And that is really important to investigate in order to let people make informed decisions. And even if, even if we assume, okay, LDL, high LDL, it's bad. High Apple B, it's bad. And, you know, the risk profile might differ in person to person, but it's not as optimal as having lower levels. Let's just go with that for devil's advocate. What we do know is that in different scenarios, there will be a different risk profile associated with a given LDL level, right? So basically the slope between LDL exposure and say plaque accumulation differs. And understanding that difference with the absolute risk is, is incredibly important. Because it's like saying, you know, um, the analogy I use in one video, you can go on my channel and there's a picture of Godzilla in the Geico Gecko. And it says LDL does not equal LDL in the thumbnail. And the point is they're both lizards. Yes. But they constitute different threats. Yeah. Like maybe the gecko gecko is some threat, but Godzilla is a whole different level. So like, do you want to drop a nuclear bomb on, you know, Godzilla to attenuate the threat? Maybe it's necessary. On the gecko gecko, probably not. So like, you know, the intervention should be commensurate with the risk and, you know, taking into account other considerations in the individual patient. So the, the fact of the matter is we don't know the risk. In the presence of unknowns, you know, what you decide to do is a conversation between you and your doctor. But where we are now is in a place of unknowns, and we need to ask these questions and get answers. And 
me and my friends and colleagues are trying pretty hard. If you're an academic listening, feel free to contribute because we need all the help we can get. Right. I know. And, and that's the thing. And that's kind of where I landed, I think, as well as I saw this amazing change in my own physiology. But I think on reflection, I think, you know, adding some carbohydrates back into my diet, you know, small amounts, not masses, really, because yeah. they will still be consti constituted to be a low low carb but the the fact is is that i didn't need to have um you know this uh, you know raging ketosis all the time it was purely yeah. an experiment really for my own my own interest and um i feel totally the same as before so i think yeah as you, as you said nick i think it's it's people being well i, I love first of all i want to say i love the fact that you're so intellectually honest because i think there's a lot of um individuals out there sadly in healthcare as well who are not being intellectually honest about this area and they are basically saying ldl doesn't matter at all and we 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 just don't know as you say we don't have yeah. the data and also we're speaking to you know the the town people and with all different <laughs> medical uh backgrounds all different needs and people are desperate but they are looking on youtube for medical advice and they really shouldn't be maybe they should be gathering some research up and then taking that and <sighs> talking to their doctor about it as you say and then really having a frank conversation as well. yeah it's difficult because i see that the, the problems with extremists on one side say the like ldl doesn't matter side that's kind of obvious but there's the other side too which i think is equally problematic which is you know people that say let's use the term we hear all the time like lower is better cardiologists say this all the time lower is better lower apple be lower ldl is better and the reason they say this is not because they believe it entirely so let's say it's framed by lower is better specifically with respect with respect to cardiovascular risk as an isolated entity and as an abstraction not considering for the moment that to lower a marker you need an intervention that will affect other things so in a real clinical setting, we need to consider what is the risk of the intervention and you know what, what baggage comes with that. Any reasonable clinician understands that context. But I think there's a tendency in um, social media where ac academicians and clinicians are, are, are communicating, now they're forced to, to be afraid to talk about these nuances because they feel it gives license to the quote LDL deniers, the people that are anti-statin or anti-LDL lowering. And my problem with that is that level of patronization, saying, well, these people aren't smart enough to understand the nuances, so let's just give them simple messages because to do otherwise is dangerous. That patronization is dangerous because then you corrode trust and push people towards the other extreme, and this is where you end up with fighting. So what I'm try to do with respect to, you know, your, your compliments on being intellectually honest is like, look, I'm gonna talk about difficult topics. And I, I'm gonna assume you're an adult who actually wants to try to learn these things. And I'm gonna try to explain them as best as I possibly can, but without oversimplifying things to the point that I think it's harmful to say, look, don't take this flippantly, but at the same time, I can't tell you this is a high risk profile and these are legitimate questions we need to ask. So I personally prefer to communicate in that way it's really hard, honestly, to audit your impact in social media because things end up being so messy. But that's where I operate right now. That, you know, if you listen to me, you follow me, you're going to get my pretty transparent thoughts. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to give you what I think is, is functional. But also, with like, I'm not going to tell you, like, here's the secret sauce, here's the snake oil to fix your cholesterol, save your heart, lose 50 pounds overnight. I'm going to say, like, use the data. Absolutely. I can speculate on them yeah, and be clear when I'm speculating, but at the same time, it's like, here's a limitation. And if you want to be curious with me, great. And if you want simple messages, sorry, you're probably going to need to find them elsewhere. I think this gets to another fascinating example of how people love simplicity. So you have, at one level, people are like, oh, it's zero calorie, so it's benign. Or there's no such thing as a free lunch, so it must be bad. Or they're just like, this is natural, so it's good. This is artificial, so it's bad. All of those are flawed heuristics. Yeah. The fact of the matter is sweeteners are a heterogeneous yeah. group of compounds, just like fat or protein sources. Is tofu the same as an egg? Absolutely not. Maybe that's not a best analogy, but you see what I'm getting for. So we need to interrogate the literature and see what it says. And there are some really cool data on things like sweeteners. So I'll give you one example. This was out of Dana Small's lab at Yale. Yeah. 
um, on sucralose, the artificial sweetener that's popular in the brand name Splenda, which was on my radar because the American Diabetes Association has all these Splenda sponsored recipes. Zero calories or zero calories of sweetener. So they'll have like peaches and cream smoothies sponsored by like Splenda. It's a little bit. Anyway, um, so there was this interesting study where what they did was they did a um, controlled trial comparing people taking regular sucrose sugar compared to Splenda, zero calories, compared to a mix of maltodextrin, which is basically a high glycemic carb, but not super sweet, with Splenda. What they were doing is trying to test this hypothesis that if you uncouple the sweet taste from the calories you, your body might expect from the sweet, that you'll get metabolic dysfunction. So then this controlled trial where they fed people sucrose, 120 calorie drink, I think, versus, um, don't quote me on these numbers, it trying to represent what I remember, um, sucralose for zero calories, and then a combination of sucralose and maltodextrin. Maltodextrin is a high glycemic carb, it's not super sweet. So then they were coupling the kind of sucralose with another carbohydrate source. And their hypothesis was, oh, you know, if you uncouple again, the calories from the sweet, you're going to get metabolic dysfunction, you're going to get insulin resistance. So they predicted that the sucralose only zero calorie drink would cause metabolic dysfunction and insulin resistance. They were wrong. What they found, really interestingly, was that the group that was uh, induced to have insulin resistance was the sucralose plus maltodextrin combination group specifically, which is bizarre. And they didn't actually, like, that experiment didn't allow them to figure out why that was occurring. But what they found was in a short-term trial with pretty low doses, just two weeks could induce pretty profound insulin resistance in combination with changes in activity and dopamine reward circuits, the mesolimbic system in the brain. Mm. And so it was unclear. It's possible that the peripheral insulin resistance caused changes in brain activity. It's possible that changes in brain activity in these circuits drove insulin resistance. And one thing they did was they did a study in adolescents as a separate group and found the changes were so profound, they actually had to terminate the study for ethical reasons oh my goodness. Um, and insulin resistance, which brings forward some very proactive questions. Because, for example, if there's a top-down you know, mechanism whereby changes in the brain activity influence peripheral insulin resistance and you're... You know, there are kids having these super low sweetened um, oh, nice. foods that also have, you know, carbohydrates in them. Could you change the brain chronically for life as it's wiring in a critical period to promote insulin resistance and promote like, metabolic syndrome later in life? It's very possible. Yes. But the reason I highlight this experiment is because, one, I think it's a great example where the researchers had a hypothesis, they tested it rigorously, and the data showed something different. And they reported that quite honestly. And they're like, this is interesting. And this is what we know right now. And this, uh, these are the next things we need to do. So I thought it was a brilliant study. But I also think it highlights the nuances of, you know, for example, this study showed, or let's say an extrapolation from the data would suggest that sucralose might have some problems. But you're less likely to get insulin resistance if you have sucralose in your morning black coffee than if you, say, have it in a light and fit yogurt which has carbs plus the sucralose. Mm -hmm. So the context in which you consume a sweetener can matter. So again, it's much more complex than this is good or this is bad. And to be clear, those data don't rule out that even having Splenda in your black coffee can't be problematic. But just to highlight the idea that this is a very complex topic. And there are other compounds like allulose, which is a natural um, kind of cousin of the molecule fructose which actually might have some metabolic benefits. Mm -hmm. So um, it does not induce an increase in insulin or increase in glucose mm -hmm. in human randomized trials. Actually, it can cut, reduce the impact of su sucrose, regular sugar, when allulose is given in addition. So basically, allulose you have alone, no increase in glucose or insulin. Sucrose, you have an increase in glucose and insulin. Sucrose plus allulose, you have less than if you have the sucrose alone. And it has properties of inducing um, endogenous GLP-1, which is the hormone like um, drugs like Ozempic try to mimic. Now, I'm not going to say it is Ozempic because the you know GLP-1 levels induced are a lot less than the equivalence of, say, injecting semaglutide or Ozempic. But, again, it's an area of a frontier of research because it's a very different system. Like, 
stimulating your nervous system because that's how it works. It's vaguely operated to produce your body's own GLP-1, which then goes to the portal vein, to the liver. That endogenous is very different than exogenous administration. So could there be benefits? There's some literature now suggesting that there might be. Uh, a 2024 paper out of, you mentioned Dr. Demdickness lab. He just published this literature showing that allulose as compared to stevia, that was the control, allulose was protective against obesity in a mouse. Mm -hmm. So there might be benefits to say allulose for some people. Mm -hmm. um, and again, these are all non-nutritive, when I say non-nutritive, zero calorie, um, you know, alternative sweets. Yes. Okay. We can go down into the weeds with any of them, and I can provide you links to, to for everything I've said. But I just think the the point is that I want to challenge everybody listening to really just accept that whether this be the obesity fuel purchasing topic, the cholesterol topic, the sweetener topic, none of these things are so simple as it's just calories or zero calorie sweeteners are bad or good, this, that, and the other. It's always more complex. And there's different ways to respond to that. You could say, oh, this is so frustrating. It's so confusing. Or you could say, this is cool. Like mm -hmm. our metabolism is so complex. And isn't it fun to get to learn about it? And if you want to engage in, you know, N, N, N equals one experiments, you get to be the system you experiment on for the rest of your life. Agreed. And learn about your metabolism. Always have an opportunity to learn about the complexities and engage in the incredible journey that is your own N equals one metabolic health journey. And the moment you can accept that that is a fun process or can be a fun process, that is the moment you unlock the superpower to lifelong health. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think it, it never fails to astound me at the adaptability of human beings and uh, our physiology, you know, the, the range of different diets that people live on and some appear to thrive on. Um, it just it, it it is it is a huge opportunity, as you say, to be your n equals one and and try things for yourself, and perhaps perhaps it will make a massive and profound difference to your life. And I wanted to ask one final question, Nick, if you don't mind, just to, to respect your time, and uh, we've come over the miller hour, but I wanted to make sure we get this last question. One one thing that surprised you recently in the literature that was really stood out for you, that's been really interesting, that's left you go, oh, that was something I didn't didn't realize at all. Um, if you could pick one thing that is really made you go, hmm, that's interesting. There's so many things. Every time I read a new paper, yeah. Um, what are some of the papers I've read recently that I have things coming up? Um. Well, this isn't a new one, but I'll bring it up because I think people will find it interesting. And it was building off of, I was going back and reviewing some things on protein and protein related things after listening to Huber, Andrew Huberman. I like listening to his podcast. And one of his most popular podcasts recently was talking with Dr. Gabrielle Lyon. Yes. Um, and she was talking about protein and muscle. And one popular thing you may have heard about protein. So now I'm kind of hitting, you know, the the mid-level listener who probably has a decent amount of background in, in health is the idea of this thermic effect of food yes. where um, eating protein tends to burn some calories to process it. And so people are like, oh, you eat 100 calories of, say, chicken breast versus 100 calories of banana. Well, you have to burn more calories for the chicken breast. Therefore, the net calories you get are less. And this is, again, just one perfect example about, oh, it's always more complex. So let's talk about the thermic effect of food. One component of the thermic effect of food that people not, might not realize is that um, your your body, again, now circling the fuel purchasing, see how this all comes back together, is like, in order to take up, say, glucose into your muscle cells, right, you need transporters, yeah. you know, glute 4 transporters, and they're stored inside your muscle cells, and they need to get what's called translocated, fancy word for it, they move, they move into the muscle cell membrane, so you get in this channel to suck the glucose. Now, the interesting thing is that the, the, the transporters are held inside the cell by these anchors. It's called tug. Mm -hmm. And in order to get the transporter to the surface, you need to cut the anchor. All right. Where am I going with this? Well, um, your ability to cut the anchor is dependent on your insulin sensitivity. And when you cut the anchor, the anchor isn't just like this literal like neutral anchor and then the components just dissolve into nothingness you cut the anchor you then have two bits of anchor and the one bit the anchor of the anchor it's called the c terminus 
actually then acts as a signaling molecule to go into the nucleus of the cell and activate um, PGC1-alpha and PPAR mm -hmm. to induce thermogenesis. So basically it changes your genes transcription to promote thermogenesis and fat burning. So you have this incredible system whereby insulin signaling, if you're insulin sensitive, cuts the anchor to put glucose transporters in the surface of the cell. And then part of the anchor signals to promote thermogenesis and heat expenditure. Mm. Um, which means if you're more sensitive, all things being equal, when you eat, you're going to burn more calories after feeding. Ah. Um, that's the extrapolation of the basic science. So it was one of those moments, it's something I read a, a while back when I was sitting and thinking, wow, our metabolisms are so free. Yeah. And so if, if somebody followed that along, I think you probably, I hope people appreciate just the beauty of these systems. And then you can always ask the question, why? Like probably somebody asked them, well, why did that happen, Nick? As Huberman says, I wasn't consulted at the design phase, um, so I don't know, but it, it seems to be what happens and is freaking cool. And then figuring out, well, maybe why that happens, but also how can we leverage this? What is the relevance? Um, or just sitting in awe of the beauty of biology. Cool. Which is cool. Yeah. And that's a, that's a very, a very valid way to, to, to finish with that, with that amazing thought. And hopefully somebody is going to, is going to sit and chew the fat over that one. And I, I certainly will do. I think that's a, it's a fascinating area. So Dick, how can, how can the listeners hear more of you? Yeah. Obviously your details for your channels are going to be in the description, but tell us anything else that you've got coming up Absolutely. and it's cool that's happening and definitely ways that we can support, um, you know, your academic ventures, if there are any more that require uh, crowdfunding or support. Yeah. I mean, I will say you can find me at, on Twitter at Nick Norwitz, Instagram. I'm new there. So appreciate the follow at Nick Norwitz, PhD, my YouTube channel, just Google Nick Norwitz, YouTube. There are no other Nick Norwitzes in the world. I don't think N O R W I T Z. And then I started a new newsletter, um, stay curious metabolism, which if you don't mind, um, Rick, you can link below that's sure. new and I'm really having fun just doing my, like, it's basically like an in-depth journal. But what you'll find there that you might not find other places is that like that authenticity. Like if I'm talking about, oh, I'm doing this experiment about social engagement. And we talked about like that Joe Rogan, you know, example. I'm like, this is the things that me as a new creator, like I'm playing with these as engagement tactics. So I'm going to tell you exactly what I'm doing. And also just be transparent about the other elements of me as a person. Like nice. you might know me as a scientific communicator, but like I'm also like a son and a boyfriend. And maybe me and my girlfriend are going to be making like cheesecake on the weekend. Not low carb, just like cheesecake. I'm going to tell you about that kind of thing. Because I think it's important for people to understand that there are other human beings on the other side of media. And yeah. for you to kind of have a sense of who a human being is and find out if they're trustworthy. So I try to, you know, project my most authentic self on all platforms, but particularly in that newsletter, I'm going to make an effort to do that. So all those platforms, um, yeah, you can always, you know, subscribe to the newsletter and then I get money, which mm -hmm. is appreciated. In all honesty, I'm going off in this life after med school. Now I have to adult. Yes, I have to concern myself with finances. I'll figure out how I do it. Sure. Um, but, uh, you yeah, know, I mean... Patronage, so I'm not eating just hard boiled eggs from the hospitals, always appreciated, but not necessary. I'm here to give free metabolic education. So engage in every way you can, particularly YouTube newsletter. I really appreciate it. And above all, just stay curious and join Rick and I and everybody else's metabolic health arm because we need to change the system and it's going to happen from the bottom up and it's going to require you. Awesome. And uh, I love the fact that you, you said the right word there, which is uh, authenticity and being authentic, because that is something we're sorely lacking uh, on many accounts as we've become more um, infused with AI related content and uh, and Lord knows what else. But yeah, it's been a pleasure today, Nick. So and thank so you cool so much. You've been a very gracious host. No worries.